Anyway, let's move on. I'll tell you what happened. Okay, so let's just to clarify, the reason Elon Musk is in the news is because everyone's making fun of the weird way his body looked. That's what went on. So Elon Musk, the <laughs> thinking is his body looks strange. People are complaining about it. David texts, David messages me in Slack and goes, hey, you should do a story where you say people shouldn't ba- make fun of Elon Musk because my body looks worse, meaning me. David's saying, hey, you, Jason, the guy everybody's saying has an ugly body. Yours is worse. You should show everybody how much worse it is. And there's your story. Welcome to the Utopian Podcast. Are you guys not running this off the Aston Martin Lagonda's computer, are you? Because that would be the problem. If that, so. How fantastic would that be, though? That would be do that. that. <laughs> Oh, well, does okay, anything okay. in that car work? Does any like any of the computer, you know, CRT? They have stuff? worked. I've seen them work before. Yes, uh, 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 not well. Uh, I'm actually being given a payphone to convert into a, a stupid Rick rolling machine for my friend's arcade bar, and I saw inside it the main CPU that's used in that payphone is the same one that was used in the Aston Martin Lagonda. So I'll still gonna... pry it out of the socket, and we can have a backup. Yeah, we got to figure this one out too. By the way, Jason, uh, g- good job of the first uh, uh, taillight quiz there. Uh, you got the easy ones, even though I don't I know how anyone could call it a clat an easy one. But uh, <laughs> d- okay. were those recent acquisitions, Bo? Yes, they're they're new here at uh, Galvin. All There's right, so yeah. every now and then, Jason and I will get a text from Bo, and it will just be the taillight, and that's how Jason and I know <laughs> that Bo has recently purchased something. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Look at this. Yeah. This, these are both Lotuses. Although this yes. tail light, my Reliant Scimitar used the same unit, and a Jensen Healy uses this same unit. So that's uh, that gets a lot of work. This yeah. is the, the Eclat. And then um, there's this no, one. Actually, the a, other one was the Eclat. The other, was, other one was the Eclat. Right. Yeah. This is the uh, Elan. Uh, yeah, Elan. Right. And then this one, I think, is I've seen this unit before. <laughs> I think it's German. I haven't quite narrowed down. You're correct. It You're correct. Yeah, You're it's, warm. It's a German tail. I've seen it on other things. Very obscure. That's my hint. It's almost. It's it's Go-Go Mobile? It's not a Go-Go. It's not a... Go-Go's Michael, are quite it? common, David. You gotta oh, know. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. So, yeah. <laughs> It's not a, I've seen these on Mycos, but I don't think it's a Myco. So that Myco. That's why I gave you a little bit of the exhaust. It just, you know, because I know that taillight's on other cars, too. So I want to give you a little <laughs> shape of the body. I can just it's see like, Bo just. It's just, not a Berkeley. Just, it's not I can Berkeley. just see Bo standing behind this car and just spending like an hour framing it exactly right. Just so that Jason has just enough. And then the other one, which is. Uh, I, I did take actually several pictures to get just the right one for him. This one has to be British. I, I, is this it British? is British. And Definitely it's also, British. I know that. And I need to. Um, there's a, the problem is there's a number of British cars that use a. Vi- like these are just off the shelf round lights. A whole bunch use it. So I just got to really figure out. And that's that's why that one's especially tricky is because it's a similar setup to other cars. And yeah, that, one's, that one's not that. So, okay. All right. Um, well, keep, I am, uh, um, well, keep Jason uh, quizzical. It almost yeah. made me not finish an article earlier. but I, I, <laughs> No, it did make it not I'm glad finish you, an article. I, Thanks I, a lot. I'm glad you – yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, All right. Um, we should probably get started. Um, it is um, – almost one o'clock here in Germany where there, and there is no AC. So I'm so tired, but we got to keep going. I took a couple of shots of PB blaster to keep me going. So yeah. 1 AM in the morning. Yeah. Uh, correct. Oh, good for you. You trooper. I love it. Good That's job. right. You know, right. Keep this, get it going. Uh, and I'm not in a uh, Taco Bell bathroom this time. Excellent. Um, so we've, we've upgraded. No, we, we are doing well. <laughs> I don't know about Taco Bell in Germany. So just take your word for it. Uh, All right. Welcome to the Autopian Podcast. Woo-hoo. Like our website, theautopian.com. This podcast serves, the whole point of this podcast is to serve the car enthusiast com- community by creating content that informs and entertains while celebrating the unifying quality of automobiles. In other right. words, we're just a bunch of car nerds. Well said, you know, sir. Car nerds welcoming every other kind of car nerd there is. We love the car nerds. 
we do. That's right. We is so the car nerds. We are, and not not only are we the car nerds, um, but we're going to be bringing on more car nerds later today. We'll have someone who literally quit his job to make a podcast about AMC. That's American dedication. Motors Corporation. That is true dedication. Uh, that's just a small example of the folks we'll have on here. We'll have people from the industry. And then you'll be hearing from, of course, way too much from us three nut jobs. Um, yeah. Or us two. I, I don't know if I should call you a nut job, Bo. Um, that's because you don't know me that well yet. <laughs> right. I, there's a lot. Wait line, till you right? move to LA, man. It's going to be good. We're going to have fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, today's podcast, we're going to discuss some of the latest articles on, on the Utopian, um, yeah. many of which, uh, some of which are news, some of which are just uh, weird, weird stories. Um, the first. Story we're going to discuss. Um, we're going to call this section of our podcast "Stripper Model." It's going to be about. Well, we've got a whole agenda here. Is that right, David? <laughs> I do have an agenda. <laughs> and stripper model can mean different things to different stripper people. Model, but yes. this is the best. This is the best kind of stripper model. It is a bare bones lot of Neva. In your opinion. <laughs> and yes, Jason. So we have we have an, Jason is strictly anti agenda for the record. Um, but Good. I'm I'm the opposite. <laughs> so right, I'm going to talk. We're going to talk about why Russia's building base model, like very base model, not a lot of Nevas. Then this, the next section of our podcast will be called Playtime. It's about adults who build miniature worlds for their small RC cars so that their cars look real. It's absolutely absurd. The next uh, section we've got is going to is called the unsellables. Uh, it's going to be about cars that you just can't sell because just nobody wants them. Um, from there, we're going to talk about the new Ford F-150 Raptor R, a 700 horsepower beast from Ford. And uh, we're going to talk about America's weird kind of relationship with high horsepower, big SUVs and trucks. There seems to be, it is complicated. Uh, then we're going to talk, we're going to talk about Jason's rant. He went on a long rant about how uh, art aficionados are not giving cars enough credit as art pieces they're calling them low brow and jason's not gonna have that we're gonna talk no, I'm not about well it. there's nothing wrong with low brow out art let me just say that first of all so I but wrong, but i think that i actually think the whole low brow high brow differentiation is archaic and classist art yep, is art i agree with that I, i'm yeah i'm just not having it and also Good. i wrote this because i every uh every couple of years i have to use my art history degree otherwise <laughs> And then it's completely that's true, and otherwise it's just gone. If you don't use it, you lose it. It's gone. Yeah. Um, all right, and then uh, then we're gonna talk. But then we have this section uh, called "Spill the Tea." It's where Jason basically complains about uh, uh, my editing uh, on the site and uh, the, <laughs> all the arguments we have. Uh, I can't to, wait for yeah. this one. Basically, David and I we we work closely together. It's it's like a marriage. We work closely together, <laughs> uh, but. We uh, will butt heads a lot during the week. You guys don't get to see this because we hide it from the readers. And we're going to let Bo here kind of help us arbitrate our and, our and I don't get to see it either. So this is going to no. be new for me, too. So yeah, this, is, this is, is great. I get a peek behind the scenes. There is a little Elon Musk themed thing today that is yeah. it's not going to be a good look for me. But uh, or Jason, really, uh, no, no, but, no one comes out ahead. That's, that's no, 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 it's going to be bad. And then we're going to have Joe Ligo on the man who quit his job. Uh, to film the AMC documentary. Anyway, let's start with Stripper Model. All right, All right I'm going to share my screen. We're going to talk about uh, Jason's story about base model lot of Nevas being produced right now. Yeah, uh, so go ahead and share it, David. And I'll, I'll intro this a little bit. So uh, just to be clear, this is not... Uh, I love the lot of Neva. This car, I think, is great. I've driven them before. They're a lot of fun. There's a stripper model, which actually is appealing. But why this is happening is not good, because this is a direct result of the ridiculous war that uh, Russia is waging on Ukraine. I'm not a fan of the war. It's I think it's senseless and ridiculous. And part of what's going on is a lot of the world agrees, and there's all kinds of restrictions and sanctions against Russia. So they can't get a lot of the high-tech parts they need. So they're taking the Neva car that was designed and uh, in 1977, it still looks basically like it did in 77, but over the years, they did put modern electronics in it, had anti-lock brakes and airbags and stuff. Not now. The new 2022, what did they call it here? Like the classic Nevar? Yeah, uh, classic. Is, 
Classic 22 means no ABS, no um, no airbag, no radio head unit even. They give you, it's like radio prepped, which for Neva probably means there's a hole in the dash. No speakers. <laughs> Literally a not, hole. Like, they took out Audio everything. preparation. Look at that. I have to say, though, yeah. as basic as this is, you have to give someone credit for saying, you know what? We're going to market this. We're going to give it its own. We're going to call it a classic 22. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just a car when, that doesn't when have nothing anything. else works. Try marketing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the right. thing is they couldn't have picked a better platform because the Neva, everything electronic and sophisticated that was on the Nevas you bought recently was just grafted on. Like nothing was built into this thing from the start. But and here's the whole thing. Like this to me isn't even base. Like what's lower than base? Cause this is, this is less than a base model really. Right. It really it's, is. Yeah. I mean, they've, a I mean, hole for a radio? No. Yeah. That's absurd. No airbag? What other modern car can you buy with no airbag, no ABS, nothing? And they did mention there's a – didn't they mention something about there's like a, a trip computer that they added, which is basically oh, like yeah. – a digital clock. <laughs> I don't even know if it does anything. But like a digital clock from the seventies too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like no, not dot matrix. These are like the old seven segment. There it is. Like this thing. Wow. Yeah, it's Fantastic. ridiculous. Now you've but, driven. You've driven a Neva. I have. Have you driven a Neva, Bo? I have not, but I have probably spent more time in the back seat of a Neva than anyone you know. That's probably my, really. My brother had a Neva. Oh, and, really? Yeah, he lived in Sierra Leone for five years, and it's what we would take to go into the bush. So oh. I have driven in this thing through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bush miles out in the so, middle of nowhere in some of the most dangerous areas in the world. It was, it was actually really fascinating, fantastic. Well, how does it do? How does it do? Uh, it, God, I had a 14-year-old back at the time, so uh, you know I, I was okay. But it's it's virtually miserable. There's nothing in there. It, it, you're you're like right over the the shock in the back. It's just up and down the entire ride. It's 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 horrifying. It's the worst ride you could possibly imagine. How's Let's driving it? Uh, that is amazing, I thought. So I had one in Iceland. I drove it around a lot. The Neva is a contrast because it's simultaneously. I've never had a car like this. At, it feels like you could tear it apart with your hands without breaking a sweat. And at the same time, it's somehow one of the most rugged things yes! you can drive. It makes no sense. And, right? and, and that's shockingly accurate. Because <laughs> it literally feels like if I had to yes. pull it apart, I could. And at the same time, you'll take it through anything. And it does yes. great off. A complete oxymoron. Yeah, the, the heat. So it, you know, because it's cold, where you know in Russia and where these things are. But the heat has you know vents like everything else. But the way the heat comes out, it's like a baby overfilling a diaper because it none of it actually comes out of the vents. It just oozes out of the, all the cracks in the dash. You can't actually figure out where it's coming from. It's just a constant warm ooze. It's that's like, all you really need, right? It, it's what do you need vents for? Oh, yeah, what I have to say, this. Maybe they're cosmetic. Look at you this. Americans and your consumerism. It's your look, I, I love it. I, I have mean, to say, terrible. though I'm not obviously not pleased with the reason for the existence of this classic 22, I do like the idea of a, a base stripper model with nothing to break, yeah. especially on an off road vehicle. Like, especially like in the car enthusiast world, as we talk about classic, like older, like on a new car, a base model is usually not cool, but on an old car, Base models are like coveted by enthusiasts, you know, crank windows, like a, a Jeep Cherokee with crank windows and a stick shift. And there's a uh, huge appeal to it. And how much yeah. does this go for, David? Like, I think we put the price in there. We converted it from rubles. Like it's uh, 800,000 yeah, rubles. 14 grand. You oh. can't buy anything in the U.S. practically. Well, maybe you can get like a spark, but like there, there is a hole in the bottom. I think of the that's quite expensive for what this car is. Yeah, yeah now that different. you think of it, actually. Yeah. Bo is right. <laughs> Bo is right. Like, you could get a Maverick. Know. Yeah. yeah, a Maverick for nineteen nine nine five, like uh, that is actually feels like, a, like in the context of a uh, like fairly basic vehicle, right? Steel wheels doesn't even have cruise control. Uh, do you sell any of those, Bo? Base Mavericks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we would sell everyone we could get. We just oh, you, can't you get okay. very many right now. Everybody yeah. wants every, and I agree, by the way, like base models are very hot, you know, depending on, on what it is. Uh, base Shelby is not so much, but you're looking at a, a Maverick and uh, Broncos, you know, people dig the base because they can also build on it as well. So I think mm -hmm. base is very cool. Yeah, I even kind of like when you get in a car and you see all the blanking panels for all the crap you <laughs> ordered and you didn't. It's just like flat, flat plastic panels everywhere. I miss that. I don't know if cars do that anymore. 
Although, yeah, not well, sort of. Uh, All right, we're, we're look. We're gonna okay. move on. Yes, moving we're on. Move on. on to the Before next. Before we topic. move on, just imagine in your head for a second, sc- full size infotainment screen delete, like a yes. like a eight and a half by eleven, <laughs> like, a, like a twelve inch. <laughs> It was like a single din radio in the middle of it, just a big. I want to speak. Okay, well, I will say on the on the radio delete in a four GT, it is literally just a metal panel, black <laughs> pad that goes on there. It's pretty funny. Yep. Wow. So nothing there. Okay, this right. is cool. Mm-hmm. All right, this is this is bizarre. Look at so this picture right here. Yeah, that lead image like, says it all. This the looks like. So, Tacoma. so those of you who are just listening, this is a picture of a Toyota Tacoma that looks 100% like a Toyota Tacoma. And a guy's got his hand in there between the fender and the wheel, and he's pulling the wheel. And you're just going, wait, this is Photoshop or what is this? But this yeah, no, is not Photoshop. Between his thumb and forefinger is the entire yes. size of the tire. So yes. it either looks like a giant hand or a small car, and it's just done so remarkably well if you didn't see that hand you would never realize this thing is tiny it, yeah it looks 100 percent real to me so this story written by Mar- oh, our contributor mark tucker is about these uh, just a, a lot of you know adults who build miniature worlds so that their rc cars which are meticulously crafted so that they look real so like you'll see videos of these that and, and the videos have to be taken in a very, you know, usually uh, uh, they slow down the video because yeah. if you've got a, a miniature car going over miniature pebbles and miniature trees, things don't move the same way as they would if it were real size. They, it's not the same inertia of these parts. So you, they, they film it in a way to make it look like you're looking at a full-size car. But it's just a miniature world that these people made in their backyards. It's absolutely fascinating. To me, what it reminds me of is, you know, the toy trains, right? Yeah, but instead of a, a track, you're just obviously building it in real life. And it's amazing. And I love the the wear that they give the cars the and the scenes. they do it's just, is incredible. Did you see the video oh. with the, the XJ Cherokee in there with, like, the oh. like, color door? It's yes. so good. There's even fake – I think they had, like, fake plastic bag and tape showing, like, it's – uh, yeah, it's astoundingly good. Somebody's like this thing, this this Cherokee here. So there's a Cherokee. It looks just like a beat to shit Cherokee with a mismatched door. But looks the like way wild one. The dents yeah. And the plastic on the back window. It's it's just so brilliant. Good. Yeah, I didn't even notice the plastic before you said that. But it looks so right, good. Really, like where the uh, the film is coming off, and then the rear window looks like it's just a plastic bag. See, and that actually the, with the suspension looks pretty real the way it happens. It's cool. You got to check this out. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. People spend a lot of time, and I love it. I think it, it's great. It, there are so many people who like build these small worlds and spend a lot of money because these are these are not just like RC cars that you buy at the store. Like they have like metal drive shafts and transfer cases and axles, and yeah. it's it's expensive uh, and it might seem like an odd hobby, but it's I don't in the context of cars. Not that odd, I don't think. Oh, I love car models, as most car people do. And uh, like when we're doing our car show, we have a model car show as well. And it's amazing the detail and and just the the amount of work and effort and art that goes into these is just outstanding. I love them. David, scroll down to the one Mark built, the Land Rover, because let's just let's just highlight Mark built this one from scratch. Crazy. Uh, it's good. Yeah, this this red one from so scratch. Because that's not a kit. Like this no, kit is like the tires and stuff. But That's all amazing. that metal work is hand formed. It's with a Dremel so- tool. Uh, 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 yeah, it's it's just incredible. Just fantastic. all right. Good. All right, let's move on to the next story in yep. that, the next section: the unsellables. Okay, so this uh, was sparked by an article by Stephen Walter Gosson, uh, local to Jason in North Carolina. He's a guy who buys a bunch of really junky cars that are dilapidated, non-running. He brings them back to life. He gets them back on the road. Um, he does it for fun. You know, makes a couple bucks here and there, but, you know, that's not, he does it for fun. He does it for ecological re- reasons. It is, uh, he, he's always got something new, but this time it was these J-body GM cars, these coupes, Chevy Cavaliers, Pontiac, what is the Sunfire? Yeah. These cars. Everywhere. These cars that used to be everywhere that he found, even in this market, he could not sell them. So he he, rep- he fixed these things up. In one case, he replaced the cylinder head and timing chain, and he couldn't sell it. Like these cars, twenty five hundred bucks for a running driving car, 
and the, it was a coupe. It's a J body, a manual transmission in one case. Can't get rid of it. But he did. But that's he, the thing. He, he eventually did sell. It. That's why <laughs> I mean, you're, you're selling an unsellable car, and I'm here to say every car is sellable. As my <laughs> dad used to say, "There's an ass for every seat." So <laughs> as long as you can get it running and driving, you somebody will buy it. But the point is, if it's just a piece of junk sitting there, it's you know it's worthless. But the amount of effort that he put into these really shitty cars is is pretty extraordinary. Uh, I'm not yeah. sure it's completely sane because he's putting way more effort than I think the value of his time is. But uh, I gotta you know I, I gotta hand it to him. He's he saved a couple of cars that otherwise would have been in the junkyard. Uh, but uh, boy, uh, he looks a little worse for wear from it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I have to say, like th th these cars, there there are cars that they get to a point in their lives where. They're worth so little that even something small like a broken spring, it, the, 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 the cost of your, of your time to fix it, it's never going to pay off. And th it's this time period That's true. where these cars end up in the junkyard. And yep. then, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, we're like, yo, where are all the sunfires at? <laughs> yeah, I think what this article did more than anything is it made me pay attention to these cars that I have not thought about in so long. And they used to be True. just background static of the driving world. They were everywhere. Those Cavaliers were everywhere. The Sunfires, but I'm looking at them now with like new eyes. The Sunfires kind of cool looking. I love the sloping headlights it has. And it's not the worst looking thing in the world. I don't know. They're, uh, they it, made me appreciate these things that normally I thought are so boring. I couldn't even imagine wasting any so, time on them. But it's so weird you know. say that because I'm looking at it now going, I used to hate that thing, and it's it's not that bad, you know. Yeah, like, oh, I yeah. Can't you just anywhere. wait a few more years, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there's to, to your point. Cool about it. Yeah, and it's so I think it's important because these are the cars that will be forgotten. Yes. These are the ones that nobody's restoring, nobody's still keeping in a museum, and we're going we're going to lose something if we completely miss out on them. So I'm glad. I'm glad he's out there but, packing away. At by the way, I do love ma mundane cars that somehow survive and are just in beautiful shape. I mean, that oh, is yeah. one of the coolest things. But, yeah, I don't know that there's going to be a time where people are going to be crying that, uh, you yeah, know, there's no more sunfires on the road. No. You know, no, even though we might kind of think it's cool. The newspaper, yeah, right. the last sunfires is gone. Nobody's <laughs> going to care. But I might care a little bit now. Who's yeah, I care more than I did a few minutes ago. I'll give you that. Exactly. So I think <laughs> we accomplished something. All right, let's move on to the next story. This week, the Ford F-150 Raptor R debuted. Um, I wrote the story up, uh, debuted at like six in the morning, really early. And um, well, I have to say, reading the comments, well, they weren't what I, well, maybe they were what I was, I expect. So this is a 700 horsepower Ford Raptor. So you all know the F-150 Raptor. It came out with a 5.4 liter V8, then a 6.2 liter. Was, was it 6.2? Yeah, I think it was 6.2. 6 anyway, it came, came, out, came out with two V8s. People loved them. Then the V8s went away. The EcoBoost 3.5 came and people were like, yo, it's better in every way, except it doesn't sound as good. And now the V8's back, but with a blower. And uh, it's exciting. We should all be excited, except we're not, apparently. A lot of people aren't. Some people oh, are. I, I am. Know. A lot of people are. A lot of people are. We're somewhere. But like, we can't say that the comments are representative of, of America at large, but there are a lot of people talking about, um, you know, pedestrian safety and, of course, environmental impact of a 700 horse, 100 horsepower truck. Uh, it seems well, like I agree with all those things, but how is that different from an exotic car? Why is a truck uh, uh, different? It's not really different. But, yeah. Well, the pedestrian the safety like thing, yeah, is a little different, but. Yeah, it is weird. You're, you're, you are right. It's like, okay. So a pedestrian that. safety, explain it to me. Because, like, look, that thing's bigger. I can see that better, you know, if I'm not a total idiot that, a, you know, a, a, a well, Lambo that's going to take my coming. legs out. Right. You know, you can hear it coming. The thing is, if you get hit by this, the, the concern is that you end up under it instead of over it. Um, and in cities, things are fast paced. You know, I get that. Who's driving this to the city anyway? No one's buying this for that. At the same family. time. It's supposed yeah, to be the off time. the track. I mean, off the road. All you know, uh, going wherever you, you 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 can. Not not sitting on the street in pedestrian traffic anyway, right? Yeah, and, I, and look, our pedestrian safety standards in the U.S. are not. I mean, we're not exactly the strictest country when it comes to ped pro. So it's like, I don't know. Maybe maybe people are just 
tired of I, something I, else. Is it a power I thing, think Jason? Burned out on it. I think the idea of 700 horsepower is just not as exciting as it once was because it's not that hard to get 700 horsepower now. Compared to how it used to be, high, really high horsepower was an achievement. It's not the same thing now. It's been well, hold on, hold on. Here, here's what I don't get. Since the advent of the car until forever, more horsepower equals more better. Forever. There's no point in, in, in automotive history where a more, a more powerful car wasn't cooler. Like, that's just the way it is. And you're saying that's like coming to a halt, that idea? I'm just saying it's not interesting anymore. Like it's done. We get it. And it, you know, and also you're look, you're not going to use 700 horsepower. You, it's just no, not. I, don't, no. I just don't care. I just, uh, it's just not gonna. I think like, that's a little academic because you get behind the wheel of this thing and drive it. Your opinion may change. Uh, so maybe as a general looking out in the in the world to say, do we need more horsepower? Maybe not. But when you get behind this thing and it's doing what it does, and you're you know you're jumping this thing and it's unbelievable and it's I'm doing everything it was meant to do, it's I awesome. If you had a 500 horsepower version of this, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. At a point of a certain level of horsepower and how you're driving it, unless you're a professional, you're not going to know 500 horsepower is a lot of horsepower. Okay, I'll and tell you what. Fast. We're going to get a Raptor R at a regular Raptor, and then we'll see if okay. we can tell the difference. All right? We'll, we'll save that see, for a future challenge. To make it so Absolutely. Can't. Okay? Yeah, we'll, we'll save that one. So hold us I to actually, it. I actually – I think you're going to be pretty wrong on this one, Jason. Yeah. Um, Maybe. But I, and, I, and by the way, I, I do think that the V6 was absolutely phenomenal in the Raptor, and, and it really doesn't need the, the V8, so to speak. So in a way, I kind of agree. But at the same time, they're really kind of making it the ultimate Raptor now by giving us that GT500 engine, and it is it's it, it is the ultimate Raptor. So it's I'm not saying people yeah. can't have them or shouldn't have them, whatever. You drive whatever the hell you want. I'm just saying, well, but I'm not really a horsepower guy. Like I drive low horsepower cars. I like ringing out low horsepower cars. I think it's more that's fun. True. Something that's got so much power. I'm never going to have the driving skills to take it to the limit. It's just not that exciting. I'd rather have low horsepower that I can enjoy than high horsepower. I'm never going to get to do anything with. But that's okay. yeah, well. I, I, well let's I go off roading and find out. Yeah, I just brought this up because it, it, this was a vehicle that, like, man. I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, people would have just gone nuts over like, dude, a blown V8 in a, like, this is awesome with 37 inch tires. And now, yeah, there, there, there's a little well, bit, but okay. In my world, people are going nuts over it. Okay. Well, maybe so, we're in that you know, <laughs> yeah. So if, if you're at a Ford dealership, people are going nuts over the Raptor R. Okay. Well, I'm going nuts over. I think it's cool. All right. Well, thank All right. you. All right. Moving forward to, uh, the final story that we're going to discuss uh, prior to spill the tea. Um, lowbrow cars. So Jason wrote this story. In fact, Jason, go ahead. Just take it away. Okay. So this was, this is something I've encountered before. Uh, I, I have Let, just, let's, right back. let's read the headline here, Jason. Okay. Cars are often regarded as lowbrow art among the elite and it's complete nonsense. So here's the thing. And I, this kind of was predicated by an email I got from somebody. So and, and they're kind of related to experiences I've had. So uh, we got an email from someone who said they have a bunch of arty friends. And when he goes to see cars or goes to car shows, they call him a Cretan and they won't go with him to any of these shows. They have this idea. And he asked them, like, would they consider any kind of automotive uh, thing art? And they were like, under no circumstances, no way. And they make him actually feel bad for going to car events. And I think that is complete bullshit. And I think this whole the whole fundamental division between lowbrow and highbrow art, I think is a classist bunch of crap that's just used to gatekeep people out of the communities. And it's it's over. It's done. It's, it makes no sense at all. And well, they were saying it's not art whatsoever, not even low or highbrow art. They're saying that's yeah, they're not saying art. Not, is, and again, I, here's the other thing. I don't think this is controversial. This is a settled debate. The art world has agreed that cars can be art for decades. MoMA in New York, the Museum of Modern Art, has had art exhibits from for since like the 1960s. Was it, what what was the first? Was it the Cis Italia? Was that the I first the one at MoMA? Cis Italia was the first yeah. one they showed. Yes, yeah, Cis Italia. Huh. They had a Citroen DS. They have like a permanent collection of like five important iconic cars. Uh, and so, like, there's no question. We like Andy Warhol, uh, Joseph Boys, Alexander Calder, Roy Lichtenstein. All these artists have worked in the car medium before, and those are established, well-known artists. Nobody would argue they're not. I would even go further and say people who do like 
paint on low riders or people like Absolutely. Big Dave Roth are doing sculpture. All of these, like the idea that you scroll down to the Beatnik Bandit, if you don't mind, David. So there's a, um, I just picked a Big Daddy Roth sculpture of this, of this car. Beatnik thing. That is as much a sculpture as this Henry Moore sculpture is. There's no difference. One can sit on a vitrine. One you can drive around a little bit. They're both accomplishing the same thing. They're both trying to make a physical three-dimensional object that evokes some meaningful response from the viewer, both viscerally when you're looking at it, when you're walking around it. It's the same damn thing. Anybody who makes a class distinction between these two is just doing it wrong. You're thinking about art wrong. And I just had to, I, I decided I'd go through some ideas like things that tend to get classy, like props, no matter what opera. If you read the plot of some of these operas, they're idiotic. The op, the uh, whole <laughs> Ring series from Wagner is just warmed over. It's like a Marvel movie. It's just gods and crap. Wine, wine's bullshit. It's just grape juice. You like alcohol, and grape juice. Yay, fantastic. Good work. <laughs> and you pretend you taste shit in it. Architecture. Always get like you throw architecture digest on a on a coffee table. People think you're a sophisticated and erudite. You're it's classy. Different cars they just don't move. And then of course chess is just a game. So you know, you know. <laughs> like, like it's arbitrary and it makes no sense. And I think it's I'm just sick of hearing people. And I I put a story in there when I was in college. I think there's something about. Any kind of mechanical things to some degree can get shit on by certain people in the art community, even though there's decades of kinetic art. And I was doing a painting class. And I was making this thing that involved a motor. And I had another professor from another painting class walk his ass all the way across just to give me shit about it and tell me that they taught engineering at another school. I'll sneer. Whoa. Like, Why? Yeah, that That's sucks. That accomplishing? Man. You know, you know, Jason, I want you to address this comment by okay. big things coming. Uh, he wrote, he said, he has a mental model that splits nice objects into art and craft. Right. So he says the freehand sketch that the car designer originally made, that's art. Replication of that in clay form is art. Replication of that in metal by stamping presses is craft. He says no assemblages of crafts by other crafting techniques can ever be art. So he's basically saying like when you replicate something a thousand, a hundred thousand times at a stamping machine, yeah. And you build all the well, same cars that becomes craft. What do you think about that? You know, there's there's a whole there's a whole book about this by I think it's uh, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. It's called, and it's um, is that Roland Barthes? I can't remember. But there's like people have been talking about this for a long time. This is not a new uh, question, and I don't actually necessarily agree. I don't think it's quite that cut and dry, because you can have mass produced things that can become art you can have a ready made thing there was a, a lithograph in the early 20th century uh, had a whole category of things called ready maids where they would take something that was just an object there's a famous one about a urinal that, that uh alexander champ just called fountain and you can recontextualize it so it becomes art nothing's that cut and dry and okay the sketch is art but why is it any different when you have actually produced the object because something has the use doesn't necessarily mean it's not art. If you go into any museum, they're going to have a whole wing of things like pottery, which literally were used for like, you'd wash your hands in it or put beans in it. And it's now considered art. So there's, so what would that dude say about big daddy Roth, by the way, because those are all sculptures of cars that are around yeah. an engine and a transmission, you know, and they're one-offs too. Yes. Like by his definition, I don't think a big daddy Roth car is any question it has to be art based on that guy's definition which i don't necessarily entirely agree with but so if you customize a car uh, to me then it becomes a one of a kind it's your own work of art yeah i agree yeah there's uh, no doubt about that but i also think that like a factory car is art in its own way absolutely well and, and the people that you know i've worked with uh, back in, in manufacturing they are true artists the designers are amazing artists and it's just not the totally. exterior of the car it's the interior it's the, it's the materials i consider engineering an art form uh, yeah. so to me there's multiple forms of art and then you get into the paints uh, and you know like i said then you start customizing and really making it one of your own i think cars obviously i'm going to think this are, are one of the highest forms of art I think they involve I more disciplines than almost anything else. Just oh, yeah. one. And when it comes to mechanical reproduction, think about this. Andy Warhol was famous for using silk screens for his paintings. Right. A lot of right. things. Silk screen is just mechanical reproduction of images. Nobody is pointing out an Andy Warhol print and saying that doesn't count because it could be mechanically reproduced. So I don't think that's a valid argument. I think there's you know, some things are just products. Some things elevate themselves, even if you're building many of them into art. 
And I don't think it's clear at all, but I think we all know it and you feel it. And it, that's fine. Art doesn't need, you'll know it. You don't need to have a super specific criteria to say yes and no. And I think yeah. that's, anyway, it's done. So if you are going to a car show and you have snobby ass arty friends who are trying to make you feel bad for it, tell them it's bullshit. And I, I have an art history degree. So my opinion is worth whatever I paid for that art history degree. And, and, is, and by the way, wasn't it Leonardo da Vinci that built the first working auto? Didn't he build a little steam engine? Wasn't that the first or he drew it? You know about Arch Archimedes, I think, is who we usually give. Uh, okay, well, so somebody Arnold built a little uh, steam. Was it in China? Oh, no, yeah, it wasn't Leonardo da Vinci. It was somebody else. But uh, anyway, I, I guess Hero. that point was lost. But uh, yeah. <laughs> look, I, my cars are art. Done. Engineering stuff. He built tanks yeah. and, you know, all kinds of crap that was, uh, he built you know, a little... I, I, you know, Bo, Bo, you said, obviously, that you, you think cars are the highest form of art. I have to say, like, like Jason, you said you feel it. There are some yeah. sometimes you see a car just turns the corner, you know, a bright red. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's for you guys, but it's happened to me recently. I I was in Italy. Actually, you know what it was? It was just it was just it wasn't even an, it, that interesting of a car. It was like a modern Porsche 911, but it was bright red. It came around the turn at the right time. It's like that feeling. That's art. There's no question. Yeah. It's a striking object and it made you, an object made you feel something emotional. An inner right. thing with no, no actual life in it made you feel something. And that's just what the people who worked on it put into that translated to you. It's an amazing thing. It's fantastic. Oh, I just remember after a car show and it was all just got quiet and this low rider pulled up and it was just turning the corner and it put wheel completely up and like drove the corner on three and it was such like an amazing work of art between the chrome and the paint and everything else. And it was, to your point, like striking, like I got chills. I yeah. mean, after a car show, I've just been looking at cars for all day. And this thing still just brought out all these emotions in me. And I, I think that's, that's, that says everything you need right there. Because it's, that's not even a controversial thing. It's Bo felt it. And that's real. You felt it. We all have. So I think, yeah, I think so if your friends are telling you going to a car show is an art, you know. Tell the fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. All right. Now it's time for Jason's segment. Spill the tea. All right. All right. All right. So this this segment involves <laughs> oh, it's gonna be especially weird yeah. today. So um, David and I work together closely. Um how many I have years nothing now? but respect and love for David. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't butt heads because we are working closely. We are on deadlines and we, we butt heads about all kinds of stuff. And sometimes I think we should have a time for everybody to see what goes on behind the scenes and for both of us to complain about each other a little bit. And Bo is going to act as our, our arbiter, I think, to see uh, who, who gets to. I don't know if there's any winning or losing, but we'll, we'll let Bo decide. So we've been working together for seven years. So since 2015. Okay. Um, and I mean, you know, we get along great, but I mean, sometimes, sometimes there are some issues. Like any good marriage, you guys have yeah, your moments, exactly. you know? No, I mean, what do you want to start with David? You want to start with the grammar or the Elon thing? <laughs> I feel like we can't start with the Elon thing because then the okay, grammar we'll thing is really. Okay. So explain yeah. the problem. Well, the problem is when, when you're talking about a plural, okay, this is, this is, for me, for me, I think typos generally are significantly more acceptable than grammatical errors. Because to me, a typo just means your finger slipped. But a grammatical error means you don't take your craft seriously enough. That's how I see it. <laughs> okay. Um, so one thing that torched us. Oh, oh, I can't stand it. He will say a plural object. So he'll say <laughs> bottles. Okay. There are two yeah. bottles, not one yeah. bottle. He'll say if there are, he'll say there are less bottles in that room than there are in this room. When he should be saying there are fewer bottles. Fewer goes with plural. Now, if there were just one object, so like money is a singular thing, less money is fine. But you can't say less bottles. It's fewer bottles. Oh, I can't. I, that, right. I draw the okay. line on it, Jason. Here's my point. Here's my point. Now, I think. I believe usage dictates grammar. David has no trouble understanding what I meant. You go to a supermarket, it says 12 items or less. 
Nobody's confused. Nobody's no, going. No, uh, but it's wrong. Fewer, <laughs> and no one's confused, David. Nobody knows. And more importantly, this rule is entirely arbitrary. I did the research. I found out this rule is basically from 1770. A guy named Edward Baker wrote a stupid book, and I'm going to quote you what he says. Okay, this is in. Okay, he says literally in a little subheading called "less." He says this word is most common used in speaking of a number where I should think that fewer would do better. No fewer than a hundred appears to me not only more elegant, no less than a hundred, but more strictly proper. He just pulled this out of his ass. So that's I'm how grammar rules fuck. get made. No, that's not how grammar rules get made. Grammar how do grammar rules get made? Part of language. It, it's not like not because somebody just decided it. David, if I wrote this, if I was writing an article and this was how I was backing up my statement, you would never let that fly because no, he not. has nothing to back Look, it up. Look, Torch, if oh, I shit. say there's a problem with grammar, here's what happens with Jason. If we have a problem. He will just Google it until he finds a link that says, actually, it's fine and not a big deal. <laughs> That's right. That's and brilliant, is, by the way. That's how you argue. That's how you win an argument. It is, okay. is a, it is a big deal. And, and your, your, 12 deal. No items, can... your 12 items or fewer argument, that's true for Walmart. It does say 12 items or less. But in a competing store called Meyer, which is kind of an upscale Michigan-only store, it says 12 items or fewer. And that's a big right, deal. You're, that's, you're absolutely that's why right, people shop there. Classist. <laughs> this is also classist bullshit. This oh, is I don't know about that. Bullshit. I love grammar. Everybody understands what you mean. Some dude in 1770 made it up, and all you people think it means you're classier because it's fewer. Everybody knows what it is. It's a ridiculous rule. It makes no sense. Okay, wait, Nobody's I got to admit, I did not know the difference between less and fewer. And, so uh, and that's did. embarrassing, right? I, I I went to college and everything, even a decent one, and and seriously, that that was a rule I didn't know. Otherwise, I I think I'd be on David's side because I do believe in the importance of grammar. Uh, I do believe that uh, we should uh, respect our our language and try to you know maintain as much as possible. However, I will say that difference between less and fewer to me that's dumb. Yeah, it's not. It's arbitrary. It's some grammar <laughs> that does seem, but I I do love the rules, so I'm really torn on this one. I say we talk about Elon Musk, but uh, anyway. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, looks like we're, at, we're we're split on that decision, which is fair. Which is fair. fair. Um, the second one, I'm not even entirely sure where why we're even bringing this one up, but Jason I, is I insisting. Okay, so um, earlier this week, some photos of Elon Musk on vacation came out. <laughs> and um poor guy yes people were just being kind of rude uh about his physique um and i don't know why but um i figured you know how do we get a story out of this without bashing him <laughs> and well i forgot what happened after that anyway let's move on i'll tell you what happened okay so let's just to clarify the reason elon musk is in the news is because everyone's making fun of the weird way his body looked that's what went on. So Elon Musk, the <laughs> thinking is his body looks strange. People are complaining about it. David texts, David messages me in Slack and goes, hey, you should do a story where you say people shouldn't be, make fun of Elon Musk because my body looks worse, meaning me. David's saying, hey, you, Jason, <laughs> the guy everybody's saying has an ugly body. Yours is worse. You should show everybody how much worse it is. And there's your story. Oh, now, that's pretty bad, David. It's pretty oh, it's bad. bad. One, yeah. the, everybody's a little bit vain in some ways. I'm 51, and I will admit, when I saw those pictures of Elon, again, the richest man in the fucking world, I did think for a second, huh, I'm not doing so bad as a 51. <laughs> <year old." laughs> I thought I was a little better. And then David comes at me, your, <laughs> your body is <laughs> uglier than his. Show everybody it's uglier so the richest man in the world won't feel bad. Yes, oh. exactly. That's fair <laughs> feelings no, i think it's, 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 wasn't it's he so, making fun of himself so, too uh, and it also uh yeah why, why are we talking about this i, I, I don't this, know because I, was, thought, I thought this was like an automotive site and we're talking about elon Musk's so nipples bad. that's well what hurts he much. is the the leader of a prominent uh automobile company and um and it was hilarious so that's why we talked about it anyway um, <laughs> Poor I wasn't guys, serious. Just to take a vacation. What's your, what's yeah. your call at, uh, Bo? What? There's no call. There's no one's right here. Well, there's I mean. a call. There's a call. 
<laughs> oh, I, I, I'm on Jason's side on this one. Yeah, yeah the, the poor. Yeah, it's, it's, look, it was. You know, it, I'm already short and old. I don't need David telling yeah, me. I, it, I absolutely, that's what's cut and dry. Terrible. Was it worth the joke though, Jason? Team Jason, Team Torch. I think we. Team Torch. Sure, I could have taken a picture that looked terrible, but why would I want to do that? <laughs> Look, I wasn't. We, we were never going to write that story, but it was worth the joke that we're having right now. Thanks for listening to the Utopian Podcast. Come back next week; it will be epic.